Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, The Future of Storytelling. Uh, as an industry leader in gift planning marketing, Stelter is committed to providing innovative solutions and education for your marketing needs. We're very happy to provide this complimentary webinar today, which is presented by Professor John Z. Tribus. Uh, before I pass it off to John, I wanted to just give you a couple notes about our webinar series this year. Uh, many of you probably joined us in January and February as we did a couple webinars on the new tax law changes. Um, and then today is our, our most current webinar um, with Professor John Tribus. Uh, coming up in May, we have Jeff Comfort, who is with Oregon State University Foundation, and he'll be speaking about valuing gifts and gift agreements for plans giving. Um, and then in June, we have Scott Lumpkin, who is principal at Scott Lumpkin Associates, who will be giving his presentation, Learning to Speak to Gift learning to speak gift planning, excuse me. And then later on in the year, we have Professor Russell James, who is with Texas Tech University. He's going to join us and present some brand new research that he's done um, on fundraising. So if you're interested in those, and we have a handful of other um, in our curriculum this year, you can head to our website, stelter.com backslash webinars, where you'll find a list of all of those webinars, um, and you will be able to register for those. So today, presenting for us, again, as I said, is Professor John D. Tribus. John is a storyteller, a social strategist, and a speaker who's on a mission to help impact organizations embrace the blur between sectors, functions, departments, and human strengths for good. He leads and manages Georgetown University's Center for Social Impact Communication, which is a renowned research and action center, which works to unite works to ignite the power of responsible fundraisers, marketers, communicators, and journalists to combine their strengths within an organization to drive societal change. John has served as a personal advisor to world-famous chimpanzee expert, Dr. Jane Goodall. He's been a strategy lead within the British Embassy and has worked as a social innovation consultant to Tiffany & Company, L'Oreal Paris, Coca-Cola, Women for Women International, and other clients. John's a professor of social impact at Georgetown University, and he's currently pursuing his PhD from Concordia University, Chicago. John's a proud father of a hairless cat, which I think you're going to meet in just a minute, named Penelope, and he lives in Washington, D.C. Now, I have not yet had the pleasure, but many of us at Stelter have seen John speak over the past couple of years at our national conferences, and we've always been very impressed with him. And so we are very excited to have him as a part of our 2018 curriculum. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so much, Jen, and good afternoon, everybody. We've got to get right down to business. And as you heard, you saw my glamour shot which I wish I looked that good in person, and you heard about all my background and all that boring biography stuff, but my most important role, I always say, is that of father. And as you see, my daughter is a little bit different. Her name is Penelope. She is a hairless cat. And a way to think about Penelope's personality is equal parts monkey, dog, and cat, because these hairless cats, the Sphinx, have a personality like no other. So she sleeps in the bed with me. She feels like a warm piece of velvet uh, or a warm peach to the touch. She also has that bristly, normal cat tongue. But we have a wonderful life together. Some people have jokingly said that our life is kind of like Beauty and the Beast, which it basically is. You can guess who is the beauty and who, who is the beast. But I'm so thrilled to be with all of you today. Um, I know a lot of you are probably in rooms together with your colleagues and your teammates, which is fantastic. And what we're gonna talk about today, of course, is storytelling, but especially the future of storytelling. And I'm gonna share with you some thoughts I have about how storytelling is going to evolve as we go forward within the social impact sector. So before we do that, uh, a topic of storytelling, you guessed it, I have to start, other than Penelope, with an actual story. And so the story that I wanna tell you today is about what happened to me on March 8, 2006 at the Marriott Wardman Park Hotel in Washington, DC. This was the day that changed my life. And maybe you've had a moment in your life's journey where you look back on it years later 
and you realize how it was really a turning or a tipping point, really setting you on a path that perhaps you really didn't expect. And that's what happened to me on that day. Like all good stories, I've got to build it up a little bit. I can't immediately give you the punchline. So the backstory is that at the time I was working for National Geographic, and probably like many of you, I've always been so inspired by National Geographic's really simple but yet compelling mission of inspiring people to care about the planet. And I knew about National Geographic ever since I was a young boy. Here's a picture of me growing up in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, I'm still patriotic, unfortunately no longer blonde. of this lady, Adele Vasek, who was my grandmother, but more accurately, she's my nana. And if you have a nana, you know a nana, or you are a nana, you know that grandmothers are great, but nanas are an absolute. This is faux leopard print, don't worry, from the Home Shopping Network, by the way. Nana is a big deal. She is literally the living embodiment of an anti-mame character larger than life. And so Nana was the one that bought me that subscription to National Geographic. And when you know a little about, a bit about Nana, it's not surprising because Nana is a woman absolutely ahead of her time. Total fashion plate, as you can see, there we are together throughout the years. But Nana is a woman ahead of her time in a number of different ways. First is that she's a woman ahead of her time as a teacher. And Nana has been a teacher for more than 50 years in Berwyn, Illinois, uh, the suburbs of Chicago, and she was ahead of her time as a teacher. She taught history and geography and languages, and she was one of those absolutely beloved teachers. With my teaching, someone that I really aspire to be for my own students, but maybe you've had a teacher like this that just goes above and beyond, and that just kind of creates magic in the classroom as well as outside. So this photo that you see, is in the state capital of Illinois, Springfield, Illinois, when Nana every single year took her students there. And I don't know how she did it, but she got them access meeting with the governor of the state of Illinois. So this photo is circa 1970s, and this is then governor, Big Jim Thompson. You can see him, he's really, really tall. And if you know anything about Illinois politics, he's one of the few Illinois governors who is not currently in prison, or has not been in prison. So that was Nana, a woman ahead of her time in the classroom. But Nana is also ahead of her time as a traveler, as a world traveler. And Nana traveled literally around the world at a time when nobody did this, let alone women. And so she's been to crazy places at times when people just didn't go. I mean, she's been to Borneo and to Malaysia and to all of these countries, really remote locations. And growing up, this has always been my absolute favorite photo of Nana. Hangs in her living room, and you can imagine me with my patriotic young self growing up, passing this in her hallway, and you know the question I had, right? I always thought, how did Nana get in that class? And I totally couldn't answer that, so the next question became, how did Nana get out of that class? Because she was standing right next to me. And I couldn't answer that either. It's like a feat of nature. But I absolutely love this photo of her. It says so much about her personality in one photo. But what's interesting is not to, um, uh, uh, kind of a couple of months ago, I took this photo off of the wall. And here is what's on the back of the photo. Such a lost art. We hardly ever print out photos anymore or even frame them, but Nana did, does. And what she does is write on the back of photos. And what this is is an entire story. So it's a story about her trip to the Philippines. As you can see um, in her script, July 4th, 1983, and she told a story about the buffet dinner, the roasted pig, and all of the amazing music that was played for her and her traveling companions. And specifically, the, the Filipino musicians played the Stars and the Stripes because it was our American Independence Day. But that was Nana, world traveler, woman ahead of her time, and that wonderful Nana who gave me that subscription to National Geographic magazine. So I go back to that day now, March 8, 2006, the day that changed my life. This was the day that I met a rock star. So I know exactly what you're thinking and who I met. You're thinking, of course, that I met Elvis. 
And the king, yes, he's still alive, but I have met Elvis and Elvis. This was the big, the best donation of $2 on the Vegas Strip that I've ever made in my life. But as you heard from my introduction, and you might be piecing together, this was the day that I met an even bigger and better rock star. This is the day that I met Dr. Jane Goodall, that amazing National Geographic cover girl, um, a United Nations messenger of peace, and of course her formal title, she's that chimpanzee lady, that amazing, amazing chimpanzee lady, the world's foremost authority on chimpanzees. And so I was working at National Geographic and I heard that she was giving the keynote at an annual Montessori convention. And I'll admit to you, at the time I was not a teacher, I didn't even know what Montessori was about. I was just dedicated to getting that golden ticket to hear this special lady speak. And so that's exactly what I did. And so I marched into the Marriott Wardman Park Hotel. You know those conference hotels, the swirly carpeting, I call it the evil carpeting where you get really, really dizzy. But I walked on that, sat in the second row, and I was really transfixed by what this person had to say. And what Jane did really was tell stories. She told stories about how animals have personalities, minds, and feelings. And I thought about my hometown zoo, the Brookfield Zoo and Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, and thinking the exact same thing. And she also told stories about her mother and her grandmother and how they let little Jane, this budding scientist, take earthworms to bed with her because she was interested, of course, in how those creepy crawlers worked. And so I thought about my special Nana and how she let me get away with a lot of things that I was interested in as well. And when Jane was done speaking, she held a book signing. It was a particularly long book signing, lasted probably for over four hours. And when I finally got up to meet her after waiting in that line, making best friends with Montessori teachers, she signed my book, and here's what she wrote. She wrote, For John, Hear Your Heart. And I was going through a transition in my life. Was I going to leave the nonprofit social impact sector? Was I going to go to the so-called dark side, the corporate sector? Um, maybe some of you have thought that as well. What was, what was I going to do? But the message and her stories really stuck with me. And in a crazy twist of events, Six months to the day after I first met Jane Goodall at that speech, I not only was working for her nonprofit, the Jane Goodall Institute, but I specifically was working for Dr. Jane Goodall, the person. And I was traveling with her and executing her perpetual world tour, where she travels more than 300 days a year all around the world, spreading her message of peace and hope and really telling stories. So I've had some crazy adventures with her. And I thought what I would do is just give you a little bit of a taste of what some of those behind the scenes experiences were like. So I'm going to share some photos with you. And this next one is really what the entire relationship was with Jane was like. She is such a kidder. She has the most amazing, wicked sense of humor. So this was a candid shot that somebody took of us and you could see what she wrote on it. For John having a blast on the road where one of us was bored and the other one was disgusted. And there we were in the Buffalo, New York airport where we saw that even mother nature has an agent. And I asked Jane, would you reenact this? And obviously you see that she did. And there we were in New York Central Park doing media appearances for a film, one of the many that she was involved in at the time. And there we were on the loo, as they say, or the toilet in Buenos Aires, Argentina, doing donor calls because as we all know as fundraisers, You've got to do donor calls no matter where you are, and especially on the loo if there's a phone right next to it. So that's what we did. And there we were hugging actress Angelina Jolie, a supporter of Jane and the Institutes, or at least one of us is giving, getting the hug. I, used to, I went in for the hug and was politely declined. I used to say that this was the biggest regret of my life, but I, I since say this is the biggest regret of Angelina Jolie's life. Obviously, she's very upset she never got the hug from me. And there we were uh, talking to astronauts literally in outer space. I have no idea how this was actually executed, but it was Jane on the ground talking to the astronauts in outer space. And there we were meeting so many people who would be inspired by Jane's storytelling that they would take action, that they would send us fan art and cartoons. And this was one of my all-time favorites that hug in, hung in my office for many years. The gorilla was craving some attention. It felt neglected because Jane's research was becoming too chimpanzee specific. 
And there we were meeting so many people, and especially young people and young women and young girls who would be inspired by Jane's story, that this is the action that this young girl took, that they would dress up for history days at school or for Halloween as their beloved idol, and that's the action that resulted from those stories. And there we were, this is such an awful photo of us, but I have to show because this is the reality of what life on the road with Jane Goodall was like. What do you notice? This is like, where's Waldo? What do you notice in that photo? Is scotch whiskey. So Jane likes to have a little bit of whiskey at the end of a long day. So depending on how many we would have, the work would either get good or great. Usually the work would get great, by the way. And there we were, this is, Oh, this is the best. This was at the end of a particularly long book signing line in Memphis, Tennessee, where we met Bucky, who lifted up his shirt and said, sign here. And Jane being Jane with her wonderful sense of humor, signed there. And you know what this is? He ran off to the tattoo parlor and got this as a tattoo. So talk about stories leading to action. So many unusual actions that can result in terms of stories. But it all goes back to that date, March 8, 2006, at the Marriott Wardman Park Hotel with that evil carpeting and hearing Jane Goodall speak. And it specifically goes to this big idea that I want to start us off today with. And that's that stories are the currency of life. We are all professionals. We all are all leaders and fundraisers within our organization. But I do believe that sometimes we put on that hat of leadership or experts a little bit too much. That's really important, of course, and we're going to get to that. But as we talk about stories, stories are about imperfections. Stories are about connecting, not perfection. So we're trying to connect as human beings with other sorts of human beings. So stories really are the currency of our lives. And I've always known that as a story researcher and professor now, but I didn't understand that really in my heart the human heart, the seed of love and compassion until two years ago. And that is because my beloved Nana died. Nana died at the wonderful old age of 93. That doesn't make it any easier, but she did live the best life possible. And when Nana did pass and we had her funeral, it was many of her students, some of whom had her literally 50 years ago, who not only remembered her, but took the action to come to pay their respects. And I'll never forget, there was one now adult woman in particular who came up to me. You see her in this newspaper clipping from years and years ago. And she said, I was in your Nana's French class. And we had nothing as a family. We had no means. We had no money. But your Nana took an interest in me because I wanted to go to Paris. I dreamt of going to Paris. And so your Nana took me under her wing. And she said, Let's go back to my house. I want to tell you more about what it's like to be in Paris, because, of course, Nana had been there many times. And she said, I want you to try on my Parisian perfume and smell what it's like to be in Paris. And all those years later, those memories, but really what they are, right, is stories. They stuck with this woman who eventually then told me she took that trip to Paris, France, because of my Nana and those stories. In a horrible twist of events, two months before my Nana's passing, I lost another family member. I lost my father, Dr. Dennis Tribus, who was the executive director, the leader of a nonprofit in Illinois called Helping Hand with a mission of service for life that employs and cares for people with physical and intellectual challenges. My father had to stop working because he became disabled himself. He had a very rare disease called uh, multiple system atrophy, which literally breaks down the body. You can't eat. You can't walk. It literally is like being in a prison. My father had to stop working because of that, dedicating his life to people in those sorts of situations. And before he passed, we were lucky enough to have a week in the hospital with my father. And that's a, a hard picture to show, but I think it's important. That's the scene. And shortly after this picture was taken, my father had to be intubated. And if you've ever had a loved one in that horrible situation with those awful tubes down the throat, you know it's really horrible. And they can't properly speak or communicate with you. And so we had to get through that week as a family and with my father, that horrible week, to help understand that once that tube came out, my father was no longer going to be able to breathe, that he was going to die, and that we were going to be without him. So you know what happened? 
I didn't realize it in the moment, but looking back on it now, almost two years, he, he passed on Monday, almost two years now, uh, is that we told stories. So of course we cried a lot, but we also laughed a lot thinking about the good times and helping him process and helping us process his passing. And when he did pass a week later, it was all of his patients who came in whatever limited mobility they, they could in walkers and wheelchairs to come to pay their respects and again, to tell us stories about what this remarkable man meant to their lives. And so it really goes back to this idea again that stories are the currency of life. They help us to understand things that don't go right. They help us to connect on an emotional level, but they also help us celebrate the good times. And so stories are the currency of life because they help us make sense of the complexities of life. And I want to underscore that as you think about the work that you do and the many, many stories. I don't want anyone to say they don't have stories with your organization because you have many stories. Is that those stories can help connect donors, other stakeholders, people within your organization and beyond. So I want to share with you, now that we think about this from a human-centered perspective, I want to share with you some of the visions and some of the research that I'm doing about the future rethinking storytelling. How is story going to evolve in different sorts of ways? And so the rest of this presentation is not a how-to, but hopefully a food for thought to get the juices flowing, some inspiration about how we can do storytelling in a different sort of way. But before we get to the future, we'll go back to the future as the movie goes, but we have to get grounded. We got to think about what the current state of social impact storytelling is, and even before that, we've got to do a very brief history lesson. So how did we get here? Why is storytelling so powerful as a way to connect not only with donors, but human beings overall? How Realize it or not, you are already doing storytelling every single day. And research shows, so some research has shown that up to 60% of our everyday interactions and communication is based on storytelling. And it's so natural that we don't even realize that, but think about getting up today. First of all, did you dream last night? That was a version of a story. Did you wake up and talk to your family? Did you talk to your coworkers about what you did last night? All of those are recounting of things that happened. What they really are is stories. Also, did you do any gossiping this morning? Did you go around the, the so-called proverbial water cooler in your office and tell a little bit of a gossip or behind closed doors? Guess what? Gossiping is one of the most intense, interesting, and best forms of storytelling. Of course, we got to use gossip in good ways, but we always have good hooks with gossip, don't we? It's always a way to capture people's attention. But let's go to this history of storytelling. And I start for you with a definition. And this is fascinating to me. This, all of these words, this is the definition of a story. And as you look at the definitions of stories throughout hundreds of years, it's evolved. So we really started with the definition being connected account or narration of some happening. So it was something that happened in the past. So story really was about a recounting of history, right? Think about that word history, how the word story is actually part of history. So that's where we start, started. It was based on fact, recounting things, and also passing down generation to generation for education. But then we started to have all of the entertainment aspects of storytelling, that we use storytelling for entertainment purposes and a way to delight and to inspire. And then now we have all of these euphemisms um, for story, right? So if you ask, uh, if you talk about your dating life and you went on a bad date, somebody might kind of commiserate with you uh, from a bad date perspective and say, oh, story of my life, right? Meaning a sad truth. But all of those, it's so baked into what it means to be a human being. And we were telling stories 40,000 plus years ago in whatever cavemen-like evolutionary state we were at the time, walking around on planet Earth, we were telling stories. So think just for a moment uh, about what comes to mind when you think about the history of storytelling, some of the historical examples, so many of them. Th this is just one way that I break it down into the five milestones. So for example, the first way was through visual storytelling. Think cave painting. Yes, those are forms of art, but those are also forms of storytelling. 
Then I, I transitioned to milestone three, printed storytelling. Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey, maybe you read it in high school or junior high English class, was one of the first examples of printed storytelling. Then milestones four to six is we got more technologically advanced as humans. And so we had many other ways in which to tell stories through radio dramas like The War of the Worlds and The Great Depression to branded storytelling. Think uh, Oprah Magazine, trying to sell products, but also doing it through storytelling or Martha Stewart Living. And then Milestone 6, democratized storytelling. This is the phase that we're in right now, which is fascinating. Rapidly evolving. And this has a good news, bad news situation. The good news is that we are all storytellers with even a little iPhone or whatever technological advice. That's the good news. But the bad news is that we are all storytellers. So from a social justice perspective, the good news is that more voices than ever before from marginalized communities are being heard and their stories can be told. But what this also means is that there's so many voices, is that they're no longer the traditional gatekeepers, the gates are broken, so to speak, and then there's so many voices, we all know about fake news right now, that the truth of stories is in question, but also it's harder than ever before to capture people's attention, especially so as we think about our social impact work. All of us on this webinar, we're all doing amazing things for communities, doing good things, but guess what? We are also frenemies and competitimates in a way, in that we're competing for attention. And what we know about donors is that most donors don't support just one organization. And so what we routinely see is that organizations are kind of telling the same storyline over and over and over again, and donors are seeing this. So with my research, what I'm seeing is a lot of this same storyline. This service recipient, sound, see if this sounds familiar. This service recipient is in this horrible life situation our organization and our program came in. Now their life is so much better. Their life has improved, rainbows and roses. And oh, by the way, here's where you can write your $25 check to help the cause. A version of that, that I'm giving it a little bit of a dramatization, obviously, but a version of, like, of that in storytelling is happening over and over again. So this brings me to the current state of storytelling. Where are we now? And here are three headlines in this category to further kind of prove the point about storytelling. The first is that storytelling really is a hot topic. Here are the numbers and statistics to back it up. If you do a Google search, search result on storytelling, you'll get over 100 million results. Do one on nonprofit storytelling, and you also will get thousands of results. This is interesting. At Georgetown, we did a scan of job postings from 2013 to 2016, and what we found is that there was an increase of 164% in job listings asking for storytelling skills. So something to think about as you think about hiring people within your organization or your own resume or LinkedIn profile or whatever the case may be, more and more organizations want people with storytelling abilities. And then the last one is that by some sources, storytelling is being cited as the number one business skill of the next five years. Not the number one just fundraising or communication or marketing skill, but the number one business skill. That's how important it is. This shouldn't be so surprising because storytelling affects our brain in really interesting ways. And just really quick headlines here, there's this idea of neural coupling, that when we really hear great effective stories, is that we're able to translate that story into our own experiences through this, uh, through this process called neural coupling. So think about my story about my Nana and my father and Jane Goodall. Were there aspects of that, perhaps that you lost a loved one, something that resonated with you that brought it back to your own experiences? That's neural coupling at work. Dopamine, really great stories release dopamine into the brain because good stories are about emotion, whether they be negative emotion or positive emotions. And so that dopamine is released into our brain and it helps us remember those stories more so than facts and figures. And then lastly is the idea of the cortex activity, that good stories have a lot of details. They engage our senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, if we're talking about coffee, we don't just say coffee. We're talking about that rich Starbucks um, 
a really kind of scent of the beans that comes to life. And by using those descriptive words, it activates that cortex activity and again helps us to remember that story even more so. This is also proven with giving. So stories that told about one individual versus a whole bunch of people related to social impact activities, those were the stories that moved people to donate most. And so this is the idea what the researchers called an identifiable victim. It's a little bit of a negative term in my opinion, but the idea is that we can't process too many characters, especially in short stories. So focusing on one, sto one human story or one animal, depending on your work, and focusing on that character and telling their story is a really good best practice. The second headline is that storytelling leads to action. I shared with you my Jane Goodall stories leading to um, signing on a, a big guy's belly. That's a form of action, but we've also done research that has proven this. Storytelling has been proven to help with donations, to persuade people to volunteer to an attendant event, whatever the action may be. One of the studies that we did at the university is we looked at stories on Facebook. And we looked at people who supported nonprofits on Facebook, and we were looking at what was going to be the motivator that moved them from that so-called slacktivism, just liking a cause on Facebook, to some sort of offline action. And as you see from the statistic, the number one motivator, more so than anything else, was because of a story, that that's what persuaded them. But here's the third headline about the current state, is that we're also going back to this idea of storytelling overload and that there's a lot of confusion out there that I'm seeing of what actually is a story and what is not. So as I go throughout all of my research and I go on different nonprofit websites and I look at all of what's out there, almost everything is being called a story today. And it doesn't matter as a story consumer if you wanna think something as a story, that's okay. But I would make the argument to all of us on this webinar as fundraisers and people trying to move people to action, we need to change our own mindset and appreciation of what a story actually is and what is not because then it helps to determine whether to tell a story to donors or other audiences or not. So here are my definitions. A story creates emotion and drive ac drives action from your target audiences and takes an investment, certainly in time, and perhaps resources, financial and other, to create and share. This is indifferent to the term content, which we've all heard before. Content shares information, but not necessarily in an emotional or action-driven way. So do you see the difference here? This is kind of one of these conceptual uh, ideas. But what this is really saying is that all stories are content, but not all content are stories. Fundamentally, stories have to create emotion. They have to be emotional to drive people to some sort of action. So again, if we started to think what parts of our work should be stories and when is information going to uh, do the trick, I think that would help us a lot more with our strategies to donors and other audiences. Here's more to prove the point. We developed with our research a framework for what effective storytelling looks like, and here are the five building blocks. This isn't the scope of today's session, but in other sessions I, I work with organizations actually to create stories and bring these building blocks to life. But really quickly, the five blocks of good nonprofit social impact stories are character. There should be an effective main character who's relatable, trajectory, Something should happen in a story, right? We always hear about beginning, middle, and an end. But the trick here is that you can do a twist. You can start, start the story at the end, for example, of how it happened in real life, and you can make it interesting through flashbacks and flash forwards. Number three is authenticity, the idea of showing rather than telling. So again, that gets to the cortex of the brain, using rich details, describing what something smelled like, or using a physical object to understand the work that you're doing to physically feel it. A story is really authentic and not overly promotional. Number four is action-oriented emotions. We're using emotions strategically to use to drive people to some sort of action in an influential but not a manipulative way. And then lastly, a hook. You've gotta capture people's attention like that. 
literally within five to 10 seconds to break through the clutter. So we used that framework and we analyzed over 300 nonprofit stories to decide were they a story or were they content and here's what we came up with. Just a little over half of this convenience sample were actual stories based on those, that framework, the rest were content. I would venture to guess if we expanded this even wider that the amount of stories within our sector would be even smaller. Again, something to think about as you think about are you telling stories or content or what is the right mix? So this kind of became my rallying cry, this next quotation. In one of the survey respondents said, storytelling really has become a buzzword in our social impact sector. We're crowding the story consumer, donors included, with choices ranging from storytelling trash to treasure. How do we break out and truly influence people through storytelling? So that really is the question. And so this brings us to the future of storytelling. Where are we going? So I wanna leave you with five hopefully interesting ideas to get you thinking. These are five what I call change spaces, ways that storytelling is already evolving and I think is gonna reach a tipping point for how to tell stories in different sorts of ways. And you know what happens with trends is that everybody starts getting on board with trends and then you've got to go to five new trends. So these are five that I see right now that I find are really fascinating that I'm watching. So the first change space is what I call disruptive characters. And the prediction here is that we know how important good characters are to a story. And so we're going to remember that, but we're going to do a twist. We're going to kind of re-envision what a character in a story could actually look like. It doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional human being. And so one of the best examples of this, I can't play it just because of the technology, but I encourage you to Google the Nature is Speaking video series from Conservation International, because what they've done with all their celebrity supporters is they take on characters, aspects of Mother Nature. So you have Julia Roberts, who's literally a narr narrating as the character of Mother Nature and speaking as Mother Nature firsthand. The other really great one is Harrison Ford with his booming Indiana Jones voice. He is the voice of the ocean. And so it's using more negative emotions and this idea of a disruptive character to cause people to rethink about the environment in different sorts of ways. This idea is all around us and you can kind of scale it up and down in interesting ways. Some of you might have heard, this was just less than a month ago, about Sudan, the last uh, male white rhino in the world who passed away. And this became headline news around the world. And I would make the argument not only because he was the last white rhino, but specifically he had a name, his name was Sudan. Another example of this is we all remember Cecil the Lion and the horrible things that happened to him. His story was not unique about people killing lions and animals uh, all around the, the world for trophy hunting, but it was unique in that it connected with people because he had a name, he had a character that we were able to resonate with. Another example, look at this, this is Douglas the tree. He's a disruptive character and that's a, that sign says, hi, I'm Douglas. My family was killed for paper cups. If you often get coffee, uh, please use a, a reusable mug. After all, I clean your air, thanks. This is a story that utilizes a disruptive character and has all of the five essential building blocks in only a couple lines, really interesting. The next and final example of disruptive character goes back to Jane, this distinguished British scientist who just turned 84 um, a week or two ago, travels around the world with a stuffed monkey named Mr. H. And you might think that that's so silly, but he's kind of her mascot and he's been touched by over 3 million people with the idea that if you touch him, a little bit of his inspiration rubs off on you. But it's not silly because Jane uses him really strategically when she goes to Capitol Hill with certain members of Congress who don't wanna hear her message. She shares Mr. H and all of a sudden their light, eyes light up and they're able to have a conversation. She also uses him going through security and TSA where those folks want nothing to do with you but she puts him up on the stool and gives her passport and then Mr. H is passport, the two inch by three inch passport that he travels with. And all of a sudden, those stoic TSAs and security agents, their eyes light up 
they're able to have a conversation about the important work of the Jane Goodall Institute. And guess what? She slips them a membership and donation brochure and they become donors to the Institute. Really smart. Who, who are your disruptive characters? The second change space is story stores, or what I would even call even wider than that is story experiences. And so the prediction is that we need to think about stories, not just as things that live on websites, but that it can be physical in nature. So think about um, a gala event, not just having that as an old school event, but having physical stories or story stations where people interact with the work that you're doing and people that you serve in telling stories. So from a corporate perspective, there's a store in New York that's called Story Store, and it's set up like a magazine. And so you walk around the store, and every four weeks, the entire theme changes, and you read about the stories of the products sold, many of which have a social benefit. And what they see is that people spend longer in this sort of environment. And of course, what they're after is, is using, or excuse me, is selling products. But what if we took this idea to our work within social impact and made those sorts of partnerships or story experiences? Another way to use a story experience as inspiration comes from there's this idea that's called a human library, where it's in different libraries and locations around the United States where you, not, you don't check out books, you check out real people. And the idea is that you want to connect with people who might not be part of uh, your kind of uh, sector in life. So for example, marginalized communities, people in other aspects of the community, you kind of check them out and you have a conversation, just a human conversation, trying to share each other's stories and the ways that you think about the world. So this idea of story experience, again, is rethinking stories, making them physical, making them interactive. The third change space is virtual and augmented reality. And a lot of you have probably seen this all over the place and all over the news and probably have maybe experienced it with the cardboard cutouts and things like that. And this is a, a trend that I am watching because what virtual reality, when done well, what it's able to do is this idea that I call leapfrog to empathy creation, that it really puts you in the shoes, so to speak, of the environment and the story that's being told other than the next best thing, of course, is actually being there. So virtual reality can take us to places and social impact issues that we wouldn't ordinarily go. So a really interesting example comes from United Nations, Clouds Over Sidra film, where this is about the Syrian refugee crisis and a refugee camp. So they took this to Davos, to the World Economic Forum, and had all the world leaders watch this video with virtual reality. And they're saying that this was one of the impetus for the amount of aid to Syria being increased because of this experience. We also see this with true fundraising. Charity Water has used this in their anniversary gala event. They had all their donors don the headsets, see one of their giving sites with, their, uh, with uh, one of their water wells. This was the most financially successful gala in the nonprofit's history. A lot of other interesting things happening. Planned Parenthood um, is using this, trying to take people through the decision of what it's like as to whether to have an abortion, also to go through a thong of protesters. Um, you see a lot of ethical considerations um, that's for you to decide. It's kind of virtual reality is the Wild West in many ways. You know, what is influence versus manipulation really has to be thought about going forward. This is really interesting. This is coming out of Stanford's virtual reality lab. And one of the experiments that they're doing, what you see with this guy is he's the avatar of a cow that's being led off to slaughter. So it sounds horrendous, I know, but what he's doing, he's experiencing what it's like to be a cow. And then he goes through when the truck comes and then it stops through what actually happens within that process. But what they're trying to measure and what they've been able to prove is that the amount of empathy with people who go through this experience with what it's like to be a cow, they actually have more empathy and they also have behavior change. Some people become vegetarians. So again, lots of application for fundraising purposes, but I go back to that wild west. How can we use this in authentic, influential, as opposed to manipulative ways? We still need to wrestle with that idea. There's a lot of different forms of virtual reality. There's also 360 video and content, which you're probably familiar with, with 
Facebook's algorithm, you move your phone around and you get that 360. A lot of that is done with this little guy called the Rika Theta S camera. And he does, it's $360 on amazon.com for $360. So if you're interested in this, this is a good way to start experimenting with this sort of idea. The fourth change space is what I call citizen storytellers. And I love this idea. So we all know that we are, of course, after perspective, as well as current donors um, and all sorts of fundraising strategies. But we also know that a lot of people aren't going to give immediately uh, or also don't have any ability to give to our organization. So the idea with a citizen storyteller is that we're thinking about those in our pipeline or even those who aren't able to give, but they have their voices and they have their stories and we turn them into citizen storytellers on behalf of the work of our organization. And so this idea initially comes from StoryCorps, which you're probably familiar with, such a great model. Two people, there I am in front of the Twinkie Mobile at the Library of Congress, two people who know each other, they sit down and they tell stories and it's so authentic, it's so natural, it's good storytelling at its best. But what this idea does, is it's, it's trying to take authentic storytelling from your supporters, but it's trying to put a twist and have it be at least slightly strategic that you're picking the supporters who make sense and you're encouraging to, to them to tell stories in different sorts of outlet that make sense with your organizational strategy. And how I really came up with this idea goes back again to my Jane days when I had two superstar volunteers. There you see them. In the red is Diane Gonzalez. She is a chain-smoking, badass science teacher from New Jersey. You know exactly the type. And next to her became her best friend, um, Mary Wise, who is very quiet and demure. And they met at a Jane lecture, not unlike my own story. And afterwards, they came up to me so inspired, and they said, we can't give. We really don't have that much money other than a very small donation. How can we be part of helping spread the mission. And I'll admit to you, I didn't really know what to do at the time with them. You know, they were the superstar volunteers, what do you do with them? So they started to follow us along to Jane Goodall lectures all around the Eastern seaboard of the United States. And then they started to expand like gremlins. So they became known as the Gombe Group. Gombe is the place in Africa where Jane did her research. And kind of to get them out of my hair, I'll admit to you, I just said, entertain people in that book signing line. Go up and down and tell them stories about why you support the Jane Goodall Institute and why you're so passionate. And that's exactly what they did. And what they proved is that stories lead to stories lead to action. So I've gone back and estimated that this group of passionate citizen storytellers has told more than 75,000 stories and counting on behalf of the Institute, and what's more is that they've driven donations and memberships and other forms of action. And what's in it for them is that they have fun. I've always asked them, why do you do this? And they said, well, you've asked us to, and we have fun. And so there is the Gombe group at Halloween having the best time of their lives. Another idea to apply this to other fundraising instances comes from Special Olympics. This is my friend, Ben Collins. He is a Special Olympian, and he also works full-time at the Special Olympics. And what they have Ben do, he has the best stories, is Ben, you can see this was his first tweet, watch out Twitter, but what they have Ben do is call lapsed donors. So Ben never makes the ask. That would be manipulative. But what he does is basically he calls up these lapsed donors, and he tells them stories, and he tells them by why he's so passionate about working for Special Olympics, and he has amazing results. He's one of the best fundraisers just by happenstance because of this lighter storytelling sort of strategy through the citizen storyteller idea. I'm really passionate about this idea. I hope it's something you think about. Last but not least, I know we're going through so quickly, the last change space is the rise of story leaders. And my prediction is that nonprofit organizations, the smart ones, will restructure, break down silos, and activate all employees as part of the storytelling process. Not just us fundraisers, not just the communicators and marketers or program staff, but all of us together, we need to have a role in the storytelling process. And what's more is that we'll think of internal change makers within our organizations who perhaps might become chief storytellers. 
So as I go around the country talking about storytelling, more and more people are coming up to me with their business cards, with director or VP of development or whatever their title is. And you know what it also is saying more and more? And she's storyteller. I always ask, does it come with more money? And the answer so far is a resounding no, unfortunately. But it's another hat that they're playing, that they are taking on that executive leadership role in encouraging that culture of storytelling. And we're also seeing this in interesting spaces. Who you see on screen is the chief storyteller of the city of, the city of Detroit, first chief storyteller in the country in a city, and his name is Aaron Foley. And his role is really to tell a different story about what happens in Detroit. We all know the traditional narrative, decline, the motor city, but there's also alternative narr narratives and stories about story about Detroit really coming back from the brink and being a source of innovation. So if we think about this idea of story leaders and chief storytellers, I think more and more we can get that culture of storytelling going. So those are my five change spaces, but it goes back to that central idea that stories are the currency of life because they help us make sense of the complexities of life. That's what will never change about storytelling. Good storytelling with those five building blocks and of emotion and authenticity, that's never gonna change. But what is going to change to break through the clutter is finding unique and interesting and not thought of ways to have those stories of the impact that all of you are doing come to life in new sorts of ways. That's what I really encourage you to think about. Think outside of the box about how stories can live and breathe and really think about how we can use them to connect with our donors in new sorts of ways. So I have to leave you before questions with a quote from my father who passed. And as we were going through his things, um, I found a really interesting interview that he did with the local newspaper in our community. And to me, of course, he was just always dad, right? He just did the work that he was doing. He was one of these nonprofit um, servant leaders, um, I'm sure like so many of you, that just does the work because it needs to be done without the fanfare. But this is what he said in that interview. He said, we try to market ourselves and tell the stories of Helping Hand, not only to raise funds, but because we don't want to be quiet. We're proud of the work we do, and we want people to know about us. And so that's the last message that I want to leave all of you with, is not only using stories to raise money, but to raise relationships, to increase the work that we're doing, and to serve people, animals, and the environment that we care for. And so much of that starts with storytelling because ultimately storytelling is really about human relationships and about service for life. So it's been so fantastic to be with all of you. I know we went through so quick. Um, I'd be happy to now turn it over to you, Jen, and to take any questions that might be out there. Yeah, absolutely. We have a, just a couple that came in. Um, Jenny Carino has been listening the whole time and has a couple um, comments. One comment is that she loves the story course, so she's excited about that, that you mentioned that. Um, and she awesome. just has a question going back to the beginning of the presentation when you were talking about um, stories versus content. And she's wondering if you could give a quick example of both of those just to compare what a story would be versus just plain content. So plain content is something that doesn't have a character and is not emotional um, are a lot of the main characteristics that content wouldn't have. So for example, content might be a fact sheet. Content might be all of your numbers of impact um, for your nonprofit, um, or might be a Q&A with somebody within your organization or something like that. So anything that's not inherently kind of emotional or character driven, that might be content versus story has all of that together. It has character, trajectory, authenticity, action-oriented action emotions, and a hook. It has kind of the synergy of those building blocks working together. And the point of this within your mix of communicating with donors and other sorts of folks is you need both content and stories. The point of this is it's not an either or, do I need all stories or all content, it's an and. And really, as you think about who you're trying to reach within your donor communities, which ones will stories resonate with 
and which really want the proof of the numbers and the impact? And then also, when do you bring them all together and really kind of have that portfolio of influence of both content and stories? Okay. Uh, we have another listener who says uh, she has a very traditional president who doesn't always buy into these new types of ideas, um, despite the proof that they are successful. Uh, she suggested donor stories often, but they end up becoming little more than resumes. Um, and she's just wondering what she might be able to do to bring about change in the approach. Yeah. Great question. I hear aspects of that a lot. You know, I think it's a couple of things. I think I think fundamentally it goes back to, to it sounds like you need to do some um, storytelling culture building within your organization. And, you know, how I started my presentation, I always like to talk about storytelling, not only in that professional sense, but in a personal sense first. So thinking about what stories are you guys telling behind the scenes in the organization? So do you start every meeting with telling a story just to start, even if it's not the best story, just to remind people of the impact and the work that's happening, get it top of mind? Um, do you do things, I've seen organizations start a storytelling group within the organization that maybe meets once a month over lunch or whatever the case may be, and it has representatives from fundraising, development, comms, marketing, whatever the case may be, and they really just kind of download, here are some of the stories, and here are the ones that we're going to focus on for the month. So you've kind of got to start somewhere of just getting them out there, I think, internally, because then that helps with getting them out externally to other sorts of donors and audiences. And then secondly, once you actually start to create stories, you know, don't overwhelm yourself or your, you know, executive director or president with so many different types of stories. So what are the stories going back to your overall fundraising strategy? What donors are you really trying to reach within the next six months, whatever that timeline looks like, and then work backwards. If you're trying to reach those folks, what stories in particular are going to reach, are, are going to resonate with those perspectives? Because those are the types of stories that then you should be looking for within your organization, developing, and then telling. So don't try to make everything a story is a big part of the advice that I would have for you, but also then try to get it going organically within the organization. Okay, Great we question. have another question that's asking more about kind of the format of a successful, impactful story. Do you have ideas on suggested lengths to the story, number of words, should you use bullets versus text, um, questions like that? Yeah, it's a great question, and I, I hate to say the answer is it depends, um, but it does depend. Um, you know, generally speaking, I would err on shorter stories usually are better because people have, as we see, people have really short attention spans. But what we also know from the research is that stories are at once the polar opposite. Stories are getting shorter and shorter because obviously Twitter and other social media, but they're also getting longer and longer. Think of Netflix and binge watching. When we're really invested in a story, we're going to continue to watch it if it's a great story. So we see stories are getting shorter and shorter, but also longer and longer. So what it goes back to is you need to think about who are you trying to reach donor-wise and otherwise with your stories, and what sort of length do you think is going to resonate with them. You can also do the strategy that I call um, kind of behind the scenes as a taste of story. So what's really good with stories is you could create a longer story, whether it's in video format or written format, but then you do a taste of, you share the hook on social media or in a verbal conversation with a donor, and then you share with them the link for more if they want to go deeper. So to think about that longer story, but then you kind of slice and dice it in different sorts of ways is the best practice. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, we are out of time, so I'm just going to do one last question. Um, Stephen was asking if you know of any more in-depth conferences or classes about storytelling that you would recommend. So my, my research um, on the building blocks is uh, absolutely available free of charge on the csic.georgetown.edu website. 
So I would direct you there. There's a lot of additional great information uh, there. We're also at Georgetown, we're launching a certificate in social impact storytelling, um, which we'll be launching in September. It's a totally an online program. Um, I also do a lot of personal um, a training for organizations and workshops on storytelling. And then just, you know, yourself, I would think about how can you use some of this information again, um, you know, internally to kind of get some of that culture going. You know, an, an exercise that I love to recommend is a really quickly is a love story. So all of us do the work that we do in nonprofits, not just because of the salaries, right? Because the salaries are not the best. We do it for some sort, sort of larger, deeper purpose and mission. So a really good team building exercise is at an all staff retreat is to say, why do you work here? Why are you passionate about working at United Way or the Red Cross or our animal shelter or whatever? And you will, I guarantee you, be surprised by how many personal stories come out of that and as a way to connect for team building, but also as a way to help with the mindset and appreciation, getting us to think in terms of stories Again, first internally, and then in order externally to share them with the world. So lots of different ways to continue to get involved in it. Feel free to, if you have any questions, to e email me. I'd love to hear about other examples or success stories or things like that. I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. Great, John. Thank you so much. Those are great ideas and recommendations. And I really appreciate you spending the last hour with us to share your expertise on this on this hot topic. So thank you so much. And to everyone on the line, if you have additional questions that did not get answered or you think of something later, um, as John said, he is willing to uh, communicate with you about that. His email is on the screen. Uh, if you have questions about the webinar in general or the products or services of Stelter, you can send me a direct email. My address is on the screen. You can email Stella at Stelter.com or visit us at Stelter.com. And then finally, uh, we did have a lot of questions coming in about getting the recording or the slides. And I wanted to let you know that we did record it. So barring any technical difficulties, I will be uh, making the recording available on our website at Stelter.com backslash webinars, and I will be sending out an email letting you know when it's available. It should be there definitely by Monday, so look for that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, spending your lunch hour with us in some cases. We hope you found the uh, presentation beneficial and useful for your, your work in your nonprofit uh, fundraising. Thanks so much, and we hope to see you again next month for our webinar on gift vehicles. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.